Welcome everyone. I'm Karen Christensen with the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Chasing the White Whale, Ray Bradbury's screenplay for John Huston's Moby Dick. Today's program is co-sponsored with the American Writers Museum in connection with its current exhibition, Ray Bradbury Inextinguishable, open now through next May. If you're not familiar with the Newberry, the library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Since our founding in 1887, the Newberry has remained dedicated to deepening our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. We connect researchers and visitors with our collection in the Newberry's reading rooms, exhibition galleries, program spaces, classrooms, and online digital resources. The Newberry reading rooms and exhibition galleries are now open to visitors with no appointment necessary Tuesday through Saturday. The Rosenberg Bookshop is open Wednesday through Saturday, and you can shop online at any time. Today's program is one example of the Newberry Library's civic commitment to public education and intellectual engagement, bringing together communities of scholars, students, and the public to discuss ideas that matter in our world today is central to the Newberry's mission. Visit newberry.org to learn more about our collection and exhibitions, our many digital resources, resources and our virtual and in-person classes and public programs. I also encourage you to follow the Newberry on social media for more opportunities to engage with our collections, our staff, and stories that bridge the past and the present. During today's program, please enter your questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. As time permits, our speakers will respond to your questions. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Carrie Cranston, president of the American Writers Museum. Carrie. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us on this program. Um, I'm really excited about tonight's program, and we're thrilled to be partnering with the Newberry Library for this program, um, which is part of our NEA Big Read uh, series of programs celebrating the life and work of Ray Bradbury, and is tied, of course, to our exhibit, Ray Bradbury Inextinguishable, which is right behind me. If you aren't familiar with the American Writers Museum, please visit us online at AmericanWritersMuseum.org to learn more. Uh, along with the interactive museum where I am right now, we have a number of online exhibits as well that you can find on our site, including an online extension of this exhibit. Also check out our YouTube page and our podcast to learn more. And again, I wanna thank the amazing Newberry Library um, for this great program. And let me now introduce Will Hansen, the Newberry Director of Reader Services and Curator of Americana who has also curated the Newberry's 2019 exhibition, Melville, Finding America at Sea. Will, take it over. Thanks so much, Carrie, and welcome everyone. We're delighted to um, spend some time with you this afternoon. Uh, the Newberry, of course, is delighted to co-sponsor today's program. Uh, some attendees might be surprised to hear one of the reasons for that, which is that uh, the library uh, holds one of the world's largest collections of editions of the works of Herman Melville. Uh, including play scripts and screenplays uh, for adaptations of his works, like the one we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, the Newberry was home for one of the great textual editing projects of the past century, the Northwestern Newberry edition of the writings of Herman Melville, uh, which was completed in 15 volumes published between 1968 and 2017. So the project just wrapped up a few years ago. Uh, and of course, we are delighted to explore the connections between Herman Melville and Ray Bradbury, a native son of Illinois, uh, and in particular, Bradbury's work on the screenplay for John Huston's film. So joining us today, too, are two scholars well-versed in this history, and I will introduce them now. Uh, first up will be Jaime Campomar. Uh, he is a PhD candidate in George Washington University's English department. Uh, his dissertation in progress examines the production process of John Huston's film, Moby Dick, and deals with everything from Bradbury's screenplay drafts and Warner Brothers' marketing strategy to the ways the film impacted the representation and reception of race and disability on screen during the 1950s. Following him will be Robin Ann Reed. Uh, Dr. Reed retired in 2020 as a professor in the Department of Literature and Languages at Texas A&M University Commerce and is enjoying doing research as an independent scholar now. Her publications include books on Ray Bradbury and Arthur C. Clarke, as well as the first encyclopedia on women in science fiction and fantasy for Greenwood Publishing. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jaime. Thank you. 
Thank you, Will. And um, I want to start by thanking the American Writers Museum and the Newberry Library for creating this opportunity to talk about this topic, which I personally find fascinating. Um, and I especially want to thank you, Elizabeth Cummings, Karen Christensen, and Alison Sansone, the staff who um, I've corresponded with and who were very helpful in setting this up. So I, I want to begin um, my part of the conversation today by just giving my opinion on the impact of Houston's Moby Dick and Bradbury's screenplay for the movie. Um, and I want to say that together, uh, Houston and Bradbury are likely the most influential readers of Melville's Moby Dick in the 20th century. And what I mean by that is that their interpretation of the novel and the way that they work their interpretation into the movie and the script um, really has had an impact on the way we read the novel today. Um, and that impact was immediate. So really a week after the movie came out, uh, political cartoons in the US started um, started making visual representations of the movie's ending to talk about national and international politics. And Leon Howard, who was a, uh, a scholar, a Melville scholar and a Melville biographer, went, took a sabbatical, went on a tour through Europe in 1956. He left LA um, the day or the week that the movie premiered. And then he went to Washington DC and the movie was showing there. He went to New York, it was showing there. He went to London, it was showing there. He toured Scandinavia and I think every country in Scandinavia he visited except for Denmark was showing Moby Dick. and. Everywhere he went, he was asked to talk about the movie. Um, and so in December, he complained, he wrote a piece for the LA Times and he complained that he was being hunted by the movie the same way that Ahab had hunted Moby Dick. And he reflected on, indirectly, but he reflected on the impact that the movie had on, on politics on international politics because he found one morning in a newspaper in Finland he found a political cartoon about that represented the Finnish prime minister and his cabinet as Ahab and his crew about to harpoon a white whale called our economic problems um, so almost immediately this movie created some kind of visual storytelling that fit within the context of Cold War politics here in the US and abroad. Um, and that impact continued in, well into the 21st century. Another scholar, Edward Said, uh, in an interview uh, he was giving about uh, US foreign policy after 9-11, uses the movie's ending as an allegory of how Bush was, um, Bush's obsession against the, what he called, President Bush's obsession about against what he called the axis of evil was really uh, going to drown the whole of society, American society with him. Um, and so I, I after this preface, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the anecdotes of, or anecdotically what, you know, how did Bradbury come to write Moby Dick? How did this collaboration, which in my view has been so important to the way we read Moby Dick, how did it come together? And it, we really need to go back to when Bradbury was a kid and his family moved to LA. Um, he was already very much into movies. He used to get out of 
school and he went to uh, the studios and he, he just waited outside every studio gate and he got autographs from uh, Clark Gable, Judy Garland, Marlene Dietrich, and so on and so on. There's a whole list of autographs that he collected. He also mentions that one of the things that really um, impacted him as a kid was going with his mom to see Lon Chaney as the Hunchback of Notre Dame and the Phantom of the Opera. And he fell in love with the title characters of the movies. And you can see in his work and his fiction how the love that he has for these outsiders, for these monsters who are, um, who are not taken seriously by mainstream society. Um, and then as he grew up into a writer, as he matured into a writer, he started playing with the idea that he wanted to write screenplays. And he says that he, he was already fantasizing about writing screenplays for his personal hero, John Huston. And so he used his agent in 1951 to set up a dinner or to get invited to a dinner where Houston was going to. Um, and they started a conversation. And in, during that same dinner, he gave Houston his three published books, Dark Carnival, The Martian Chronicles, and The Illustrated Man. And they started a kind of friendship that continued for the next two years with some light correspondence. Some, they sent each other letters until in September, 1953, they meet again during at a dinner and uh, John Houston tells, asks Bradbury, I want you to write the screenplay for Moby Dick. But this is the caveat. I want you, I need to know by tomorrow because I'm leaving the country. And so Houston, uh, Bradbury, I'm sorry, Bradbury was um, taken aback. He said he, he would think about it. He drove, he went back home. He stopped by a bookstore, bought a copy of Moby Dick, knocked on the door. And the, the way he's told this anecdote is his wife immediately asked him, what's the matter with you? What, what's going on? And he replied, wish me luck, because I have to read this entire novel um, tonight and tomorrow tell Houston if I will write a screenplay about it. Um, of course, he did not read the entire novel that night, but what he read was enough for him to see the similarities of style between Melville and his work. And I think the, similar, the similarities of feeling um, uh, between their Melville's and Bradbury's work. Um, and so he took the job and soon enough they were, Bradbury and his family were on a train to New York and then to Paris and then to Ireland where they would get together with Houston to start writing the screenplay. Uh, it didn't take long for this ideal relationship between Houston and Bradbury to sour. Um, Houston had a very strong personality. Angelica Houston in her biography describes him as um, someone who would always try to test your limit, your limit and see where you would break. Um, and I think that Bradbury was being tested a lot during the time he was a screenwriter. Um, two short anecdotes that illustrate this is, Houston found it funny that Bradbury wrote about uh, space travel, but was afraid of flying and fast cars. Um, so while his secretary, Laurie Sherwood, was driving, he and a friend would pretend that the car was going fast, even though it wasn't, and ask the driver to slow down. And they, after a few minutes of that, the, Laurie Sherwood 
uh, Houston's secretary said tells um, describes Bradbury as a bundle of nerves, and those kind of hijinks went on through all, most of the six months that they were together. Uh, the last one of those was their last dinner in in London. Um, it was a dinner that Houston put together, and there were many of his Hollywood friends. Uh, Humphrey Bogart was there, Lauren Bacall was there, and Capo Truman Capote, um, and other people. And uh, for some reason, Houston was just in a terrible mood. And he just started uh, um, taking out his fr frustrations on everyone at the table, Bradbury included. And by the end of the dinner, everyone was in a terrible mood. And so this was the last time that they would be together. And so Bradbury came out of the bar and they, he wanted to say goodbye to Houston. And Laurie Sherwood, again, Houston's secretary, says that Houston said something to Bradbury and Bradbury just couldn't take it anymore, leaned in and punched, punched uh, Houston in the gut. And the way Sherwood tells the story is Houston felt proud of Bradbury for finally hitting back. And she thinks that if he had done that three months earlier, they, their relationship would have been very, very different. But in spite of all this uh, tension between them and this clash of personalities, I think that they really worked well together on the page. Um, for one thing, Bradbury brought his flair as a, as a writer. Um, he brought his capacity to just come up with lots of images and meta metaphors. And I think most importantly for the movie, he had, when you look at the screenplays, you see that he had an ability to condense many episodes from many chapters and put them all together in one scene. He calls that um, a process of oil distillation at, at some point. Um, and so that was Bradbury's contribution. And I think that Houston's contribution was sort of editing Bradbury's work, sort of making his dialogue a little bit more conversational, a little less flamboyant. But most of all, I think his contribution was creating great images uh, out of the images that Bradbury projected um, on the page. Um, and all of this, I think, can be seen in the movie's ending, which I talked a little bit about at the beginning. In the novel, the ending is different from the one in the film for two things. One, um, Ahab in the novel uh, has his neck snapped by the line of his harpoon after he thrusts it. Uh, but in the movie, that doesn't happen. Uh, Ahab end up, ends up tied to the whale. Um, in the novel, it was uh, Ahab's companion, Fadala, who is tied to the whale. And in the movie, Ahab takes his place. And what we see is Ahab get tied down with, to the whale's side go under with the whale, drown, and then come back. And as the sea rolls over and as the whale moves, we see Ahab's dead arm moving with the motions of the whale, sort of beckoning his crew to come over uh, for a final attack. And that scene is incredibly visually visual and incredibly poetic, I believe. And None of, I mean, that is not in the movie. I mean, the changes seem simple enough, but the process getting there in the screenplay were, was not simple. Um, but beyond that, um, I think that 
it, it all it's so simple that it seems intuitive and we sometimes confuse one with the other the same way that Saeed did during his interview. And I think that what that tells us is that Bradbury and Houston were able to collaborate in creating an extremely powerful visual narrative that said something about the, the world of politics after the Second World War. Um, in my opinion, we could see it just like a meme, like a minimal narrative structure that fits within the political dynamics that that came after the war. Um, I think it's very useful to it's it has been very useful for thinking about ways in which politicians um, become obsessed with certain topics and and think that there's only one way out of them and i think that 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 um that is a point that the novel tries to dissuade us about and the movie as well and i think that that image that they created sort of fits um political narratives uh after the second world war um and with that i think i I am done and I will pass it on to Robin. I'm not hearing you, Robin. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you, Jaime. I would like to also thank uh, the American Writers Museum and the Newberry and the staff for putting this together and uh, they've been an absolute joy to work with. So. My contribution for today's conversation is from a Bradbury fan who hides a dark secret. Despite having a doctorate in English, I have never been able to finish Melville's Moby Dick. Although I love his short story, Bartleby the Scrivener. But just as Bradbury takes me to his Mars in the Martian Chronicles, and he's able to transport me to Ahab's search for the white whale in Green Shadows and White Whale, the somewhat autobiographical fantasy novel he wrote about his time in Ireland, Chasing the White Whale with Houston. Today, I want to talk about Bradbury in the context of science fiction uh, and in the context of American literature and how he mythologizes his experiences in Ireland with Houston as a fantastic tale of a quest, not only for Ahab and the White Whale, but also for the symbol that Bradbury needed to finish his screenplay, making that change and defeat the beast, which is how the narrator refers to Houston at times. My experience is that people tend to think of Bradbury mostly as a science fiction writer in the limited sense of the word, with his best known works being The Martian Chronicles and Fahrenheit 451, both brilliant reads. Neither of these classic works, however, quite fits the purist's definition of science fiction. Coined by John W. Campbell, the editor most associated with the golden age of science fiction, who limited or wanted his writers to only extrapolate from what was already known about science and technology. In fact, Ray Bradbury tried often, but could never succeed in getting his fiction published by Campbell. I think Bradbury loved the metaphors and the imaginative and human potential of science fiction in the broadest sense of the genre, what fans sometimes call sense of wonder, rather than scientific accuracy. He was a lifelong fan and a public supporter of space exploration, celebrating his love for the genre by volunteering to do an interview with Walter Cronkite for the first moon landing in 1969, which Bradbury saw as vindicating all of science fiction's values. Uh, you can Google Ray Bradbury and Apollo 11 moon landing to see that interview, but I'll also put the link in the chat afterwards. It's on YouTube. Given Bradbury's lifelong association with science fiction, it might seem odd that Houston offers him the job of writing the screenplay for his film adaptation of Melville's 19th century novel. Jaime explained 
the, the root of Bradbury's love for movies. But when Bradbury was in high school, he was deciding to be an actor first. Only later did he turn to writing. His first film job was writing the treatment for the first 3D science fiction movie, It Came From Outer Space. He continued writing scripts for film and television after writing the script for Moby Dick. Uh, he did adaptations of his own stories for different medium. And of course, he kept writing fiction, plays, and poetry throughout his life. And although Bradbury had not read Moby Dick when he was asked to write the screenplay, he was steeped in the work of major American authors, as well as the popular fiction and films of his lifetime. One critic argues that Bradbury's fiction is influenced by 19th century prose romance, the genre of Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne, while another has identified Gothic elements in some of his work, showing the influences of Edgar Allan Poe and again Hawthorne. As time passes, Bradley is increasingly being seen as a major American author, not just a science fiction writer. Although I think he was simply the first to show us how the genres and metaphors of science fiction and fantasy and horror, all of which he wrote, can become part of our national literary traditions. After finishing the screenplay for Houston, Bradbury returned home and began writing poetry, short stories, and a play all about Ireland. However, he did not write about John Houston, and he refused to be interviewed about working with him on the screenplay because Bradbury disliked celebrity gossip. He changed his mind after Catherine Hepburn published a book about working with Houston on the African Queen that Bradbury thought was, quote, a very skinny book. Bradbury then decided to write Green Shadows, White Whale in order to share, quote, the Houston that I loved all along with the one that I began to fear on occasion, end of quote. Green Shadows was actually the third of Bradbury's fantastic novels that he based on his life as a script writer. The first two, Death is a Lonely Business and A Graveyard for Lunatics, are a murder mystery and a horror novel. His third and final autobiographical fantasy is described by one reviewer as, quote, a mix of fact and fantasy, with most of the fact being about Houston and the film, and most of the fantasy being about Ireland. But I think the heart of the novel is this narrator's quest to write the screenplay, to capture the white whale. The narrator, based on, but not completely the same as, the young Bradbury, is mythologized. He is alone in Ireland. He does not have his, his family is back home in America. His name is never used in the novel. He is called the Yank by the Irish and HG for HG Wells by Houston. Bradbury also mythologizes the director as the beast that the narrator must overcome using language that melds Ahab, the white whale and John Houston. A number of conflicts between the writer and director are shown all around Houston joke, uh, making jokes about the writer. Conflicts that are very similar to what Jaime has described as typical of Houston's behavior even toward his friends. However, there is no scene in the novel where the narrator punches the beast. Instead, Bradbury, I think it's a writer's revenge. After describing a lunch where the director told the two reporters that the narrator does not truly have his heart in the screenplay, he writes a story about a banshee coming after the director on a dark and stormy night. After Houston reads the story, he promises to stop making jokes. However, the narrator's final victory is achieved by rewriting and finishing the screenplay. Chapter 32 describes the narrator spending a frenzied day at the typewriter inspired by his vision of Melville. The major change, lashing air Ahab to the whale, is has Jaime described, but the narrator sees the change as possible because early on he decided to show Ahab nailing a Spanish gold coin to the mast. The coin becomes the metaphor that brings all the rest of the changes into line. Here is how the narrator describes it. The coin small as it seems, is a very large symbol. It embodies all that the seamen want, along with what Ahab insanely desires above all. He wants the men's souls, 
and while his soul is dedicated to the destruction of Moby Dick, he is wildly wise to know and use the gold ounce as summons and reward. Therefore, the ship's maul and the pointed nail and the bright sun symbol of power and reward banged to the mast with the promise that gold will pour from Moby Dick's wounds into their outstretched cupping hands. Their religious fervor for minted gold runs in the invisible traces of Ahab's equally religious fervor for the true wounds and the true blood of the beast. This penultimate chapter ends with the narrator's final victory over his beast. After reading the 40 pages of the revised script, Houston, quote, comes into the study with a bewildered look as if he had been kicked in the face and says, you were right. It's finished. When do we start shooting? The end of the film embodies Melville's theme of the power of obsession, but Bradbury's constellation of metaphors that allowed him to create that changed ending inspired by and thus authorized by Melville, shows the obsessed leader using gold to manipulate the men who work for him in order to achieve his own goals while ignoring their needs and apparently resulting in a collective march into the depths. I agree with Jamie about the power of Bradbury's and Houston's changed ending. But I think the issue of the gold also applies so powerfully, not only to their time uh, when they lived and wrote it, but also to our time in the 20th first century America, which is many of the science fiction fans I know are pointing out is we are really living in the science fiction reality. Thank you. Now I'll turn this back to Will for the Q&A. Okay. Thanks to both Jaime and Robin for those presentations. Uh, lots of fascinating angles we could take here, um, but we do have a question already in the Q&A, so we'll go ahead and start with that. Um, I'll encourage folks who haven't put in a question in yet, if you want to ask a question, um, go ahead and type it into the, the Q&A, and uh, we will get to it as time allows. But the first question comes from, uh, from Dr. Phil Nichols, and uh, it is directed mostly towards Jaime, although I'm sure both you and Robin will be happy to uh, answer as, as you want. Um, so he um, uh, comments that, that Ahab's beckoning at the end of the film version is indeed a powerful and memorable image. Uh, he is arguing that this isn't found in Bradbury's screenplay as published and that his study leads him to believe that Houston devised this image and incorporated it after Bradbury left the project. Um, and that the film as shot diverges from the Bradbury version of the script, mainly in the last third. And that the closer we get to the end of the film, the less we are seeing Bradbury's work and the more we are seeing Houston's. So um, a controversy thrown out to, um, to Jaime. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Thanks, Will. And thanks, Phil, for the question. Um... I, until recently, I agreed with the idea that it was Houston who fashion, who devised the beckoning. But I think we need to think about what the revision process was like. So even though it's not technically in the published version, when you see the screenplay drafts, you see that in that final, uh, revision that Bradbury make, which is just one day that he just rewrote the last third or quarter of the screenplay. He doesn't mention in the ending the beckoning, but as a result of that revision, he has to go back to one of the earlier scenes um, when Ishmael and Queequeg find the prophet Elijah just as they're boarding the Pequod. And he has to change the prophecy to make it fit the new ending. Now, when he changes that prophecy, he writes down, he will beckon. And I was just looking for that. And I think I have the published version here. And I think that's what it says um, in the prophecy. Um, let me see if I find it, but hmm. 
Mm. He will rise again within the hour. Um, so my so my idea is that when he changed that prophecy, he was already sort of thinking of that. Um, but it's it's open to interpretation. Absolutely, I don't. I I I used to think that it was Houston, but I after seeing what that revision dynamic was, I think it's a combination, and and that's what I mean by collaboration. You know. Houston would not have come up with that beckoning by himself. It was both of them together. Um, and I'm not sure that the less we see Bradbury, uh, the closer we get to the ending, but that's that we could talk about. I could talk about that for, for hours, but. Great, thanks Jaime. Um, I'm going to exercise moderator's prerogative here and ask a question while we're waiting for others to come into the, the Q&A feed. Um, I did wanna ask in particular about uh, Fahrenheit 451 and um, any connections there might be to Bradbury's work on this screenplay with that novel. Um, if, I'm, if I'm remembering right, I think the timeline goes that Fahrenheit 451 is um, the sort of story it was based on is first published in 1951, which as I'm learning from Jaime is when Bradbury and Houston first met, I think, um, and was, was published in sort of its finished book form in 53 um, when he sort of started in earnest on the screenplay. So the timing seems to me like there might be some correspondences there. So I'm wondering what, what each of you um, has to say about how 451 and um, uh, Bradbury's and Houston's Moby Dick might talk to each other. Whoever wants to go first. Um, I can go first if, uh, Robin, do you wanna go first? You go ahead. Okay, so yeah. Um, Bradbury had published uh, Fahrenheit just as he was leaving uh, for Ireland. Um, and actually, I think he wasn't really aware of how well the novel was doing while he was writing the screenplay. Now, in my view, I think that Ahab is very much like Captain Beatty in the novel. Um, they're both, uh, they're both very good public speakers. They're both people who have, have some kind of traumatic experience from the past. Um, they're both dangerous leaders. They're both captains. They're both leaders who are self-destructive and in their self-destruction uh, threaten the destruction of society or of the community that they're leading. Um, and I think that there's actually uh, a genealogy that one could trace between different types of Bradbury heroes that he was working on on the road to Fahrenheit, self-destructive heroes like Beatty and Ahab, and then heroes um, like Montag who find a way out a productive way out of that nihilism, of that self-destruction. Um, and I think we kind of see that dynamic in the Ishmael Ahab uh, duo in the film. The only problem is that because it's a Hollywood film, Ahab has to take all of the, most of, of the spotlight and Ishmael sort of gets erased from the movie, but I think in, if you look at his first drafts uh, from the beginning, you see that he's trying, he's thinking about Ishmael a lot, but um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my take. Robin? Okay, yes, that was where my mind first immediately went, was to Beatty and, and Ahab. Uh, in terms of their similarities, and in, in some ways also to Montag and um, not only Ishmael, but Bradbury. And I'm sort of going to toss in something I kept out of the, the written comments, um, but I've written on the issues of masculinities in Bradbury's work, 
uh, with green shadows and, and white whale, but it certainly applies to um, Melville's novel. In fact, this is a whole thing in American fiction, which is this issue of these, what today many of us would call toxic masculinity being uh, expressed and embodied in these charismatic leaders who have led uh, people and some would argue our country into very destructive and self-destructive patterns. And so, yes, and, and I would even toss in John Houston as what you mentioned and what uh, Bradbury wrote about him in Green Shadows, White Whale is a perfect example of the toxic masculinity uh, and charismatic leadership that apparently allowed him to abuse people. And, and I think this is tied to the Hollywood star director auteur system as well, that, that Bradbury, as he portrays the writer and the director's relationship in the, the book, uh, Houston is continually accusing him and other men in the area of being cowards. And Bradbury is going, fine, I'm yellow, I'm a coward, whatever. You know, I'm not going to do these sort of things that you keep sort of pushing me into. So, and that is a, a perfect example of how Beatty treats Montag in the novel in terms of trying to convince him that he needs to keep burning and Montag resists. So, yeah, I think we're on the same page there. Um, well, can I just, I found, uh, can I go back to Phil's question just for a second? Sure. Um, yeah. I found, I have the published script here and on page 159, we have the prophecy and there, and, and Ishmael repeats the prophecy from the beginning and he says, he will rise from the grave and beckon. So Bradbury writes down that word beckon. And the fact that we have the same prophecy written differently at the beginning and at the end shows you that this was sort of a revision done at the last minute. But I think the beckoning is clearly Bradbury's sort of last minute idea. He just didn't have the time to make it coherent in the script. Great. This is one of the delightful things about um, the humanities and about this in particular. Yeah. Moby Dick, the novel is full of ambiguities and clearly yeah. there are these kinds of ambiguities in the screenplay as well. Yeah. Um, so we've got a few questions uh, come in here. So I wanna, I wanna get to those. Uh, the first uh, or the next coming from uh, Shanti Nargakati uh, who asks, um, Bradbury confessed to not having read Moby Dick given that he had not read the novel what um, what do you think convinced him to take on this screenwriting project? Probably well, I, I, I think yeah. I think Jaime sort of answered that at the, the start. I mean, he's he had had a lifelong fantasy about years long fantasy about writing screenplays for John Houston, um, and here was a, finally an opportunity, uh, and had spent you know read enough of the novel to see that there was uh, enough similarities. I mean, we can talk about Moby Dick as a monster script in from the 19th century, uh, although who the monster is <laughs> might differ depending on your point of view. Uh, and, uh, but certainly the, the sweep of it, I mean, there, there was, Bradbury wrote one short story, and of course I'm spacing out on the title, about a, a monster from the sea that comes and calls. I think it's like the foghorn or something. So he very much would resonate or, or may have even been inspired because although he hadn't read Moby Dick, I would argue it's such a canonical American text that he would know sort of the basic premise. So, but yeah, it was his fantasy come true. So... I, I want to add to that. I think um, he hadn't read Moby Dick, but there's um, this uh, story collection called A Pleasure to Burn that includes all of the short stories and the novella that led to the writing of Fahrenheit. So all the stories where he was working with the same themes of book burnings. And in one of the stories, I forget what it what it's called. I could look it up, but he does have one of the book people call itself Ishmael. Um, so he might, you know, he might not have read Moby Dick, but he certainly was aware of 
its canonical importance as sort of one of the cornerstones of American literature. Um, and I do think that, as Robin says, it was kind of the pressure of wanting to do a screenplay with John Huston. It was also an opportunity for him to make good money, uh, uh, more money than he had ever done, <laughs> ever made. It was an opportunity for him to go abroad, which he had never done um, with him and his family. Um, and I think that shows in Green Shadows, White Whales, um, White Whale about how, how he's sort of taking all of this foreign land in. Um, but the way he explains it uh, is also that he felt when he started reading the novel that night and then on the train ride to New York and on the ship ride to the on the ship to Paris is that he liked the novel. He found that there was, uh, I think, a romantic impulse in the novel that you can see in his in his work. So he found a kinship with Melville that reflects that is reflected in that anecdote that he tells about him being possessed by Melville when he wrote down the last section of the screenplay. Uh, he felt Melville's presence in him. And in, in later essays, he sort of qualifies that and says, really what happened is that I had read Moby Dick so many times that I really felt like I understood Melville. But anecdotally, he, he says that he felt Melville's ghost in him. So he clearly felt a kinship there. Yep, great. Um, skip over to a question from YouTube um, here. Uh, uh, reflecting on the political context of the, the film and the screenplay, um, asking if there, there were shots, either indirect or direct, taken at Eisenhower in the screenplay or the film? Um, I, I really, I, I can't say for sure. Um, to me, the political readings that I can make of the movie are not about politics, but are about uh, wider, I mean, they're not about, about party politics, um, they're about wider political issues. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of controversy in the studio about making a movie about a disabled captain at a time, according, you know, um, as expressed by Harry Warner, the financial head of the Warner Brothers of the studio. Why are we making a movie where Gregory Peck has one leg when we have disabled veterans from the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War? Um, I can tell you that a week after the movie came out, there was a political cartoon about Eisenhower being Ahab and trying to harpoon some kind of whip. So clearly the movie struck a nerve. Uh, I think that Houston was kind of wanted to, at this point, wanted to isolate himself from party politics. He was living in Ireland because the, um, um, the whole um, um, HUAC, the whole um, House on American Activities yeah. Committee, um, and the blacklist in Hollywood had really uh, been um, detrimental to his image, his career, his personality. He, I think he was disappointed. He was the one of the organizers of a committee for the First Amendment, uh, which was a political, Hollywood political organization that uh, openly um, lobbied against McCarthy and the House of American Activities Committee. Um, but that, that public exposure really, I think, um, it, it just, he just couldn't live in the US anymore. So he just went abroad and shot all of his movies abroad. He only 
went back to close deals. So I think that at least in his mind, he was he was trying to isolate himself uh, from party politics. But I do think that there's there are political issues that are being explored in the movie. We have to think that, especially this disability question, we have to um, think that Bradbury had been a documentarian for the Second World War. He had three documentaries, and one of them was about recovering veterans at a hospital. So he clearly was aware of what it meant for a disabled veteran to come back into society at that time. So that's my take. Robin, anything you want to add? Uh, I'll just add quickly um, that this idea of, you know, direct pot shots at Eisenhower gets close to an allegorical reading and, and allegory in its technical sense is that there's a one on one correspondent. So Animal Farm, I'm fine with allegory, uh, but taking from J.R.R. Tolkien, who, who I also work with, uh, who dislikes allegory and prefers applicability because applicability is in the freedom of the reader's experience to see these things. Uh, I think that same has to be applied to Bradbury and, and Houston's film. I would, I would discourage trying to find that allegorical one-on-one -on -one correspondence, but just think about what Jaime already showed is that all sorts of people could apply Ahab to their political leaders. That resides in their freedom as um, as readers. And I know Bradbury, and we mentioned Fahrenheit 451 earlier, um, that's often read as an allegory of uh, the McCarthy era and the censorship and, and the blacklisting. But in later years, he talked about it in other contexts. That So there are ambiguities. And it's always dangerous to look at something a writer says at one point in his life about the earlier stuff, but he wanted to resist the idea that it was a simple one-on-one -on -one thing, and that it's more complex. Again, getting perhaps to larger human issues, so. I will also throw in briefly that one of my favorite little touches of the political context of the 50s in the film is where um, Ahab is showing one of his charts where he's trying to track Moby Dick. And he points to Bikini Atoll where um, the nuclear bomb tests had been done. So there's there are, there are some other kinds of correspondences in here, if not allegorical, at least uh, flourishes of uh, the 20th century invading the 19th century. <laughs> um, okay, moving on to other questions we have in the queue here. This one is is more sort of personal for I think any any of you. Uh, asking about when you saw first saw the Houston film, uh, Alberich is is mentioning that he first saw it in New York City on TV in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, and it is what prompted him to start reading the novel Moby Dick. So, what is what is your personal experience with the film, each of you? Robin, oh, my personal experience is I've never seen the film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just as I've never managed to make it through Moby Dick, the novel. Um, but I find it a, a fascinating question because this whole issue of changed endings. And, and again, that I do more work with, with Tolkien in the film that, you know, when you release a film and the director has dramatically changed the ending or events, there's sometimes very negative response. Uh, and I don't know if that was the case with Ahab, uh, with the white whale. But I also know that what, Albrecht mentioned is also true. Releasing a film often draws people into reading the novel more. And I bet that Houston's film got a lot of people reading the novel. Although I'd be interested to know how many of them managed to wade through all these realistic details of whale hunting um, to get to it. Well, my story is really odd. Like I, I read this first. I read the screenplay first. <laughs> And then I watched the movie on DVD back home in Buenos Aires. And then I read the novel and it was, hey, these are three very different stories that I'm looking at. And that's what sort of drew me into this project. Um, typically when, uh, a tip, you know, when I started working on adaptation, I was thinking only about the novel and the movie, but having access to a screenplay made me think, well, you know, the screenplay is different from the movie and it's different from the novel. And so I am only, 
I've arrived at Melville through Bradbury. And I think that's, that's great because I think Bradbury would have liked that somehow. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of wonderful how you moved back in time yeah. <laughs> from the from the screenplay to the film to the uh, uh, to the book. Um, well, I think I think we're going to have to wrap things up there. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but that's always the mark of a good program when you have more questions than you're able to get to. Um, we'll try to pass the the remaining questions along to you both so you can um, uh, consider them. Uh, but for now, I'll thank you both for really stimulating conversation about, um, about Bradbury and Melville. Uh, and thank you all for attending. And I'll turn it back over to Karen for some uh, final remarks. Thank you so much, Jaime, Robin, and Will for this fascinating conversation. And again, our gratitude to American Writers Museum for co-sponsoring this event. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. A recording of this program will be available on the Newberry's YouTube channel soon. Newberry programs remain free and open to the public thanks to the generosity of our donors. During this critical time, we need the support of our entire community. Please consider supporting the Newberry by making a gift today. You can do so online at newberry.org give. We look forward to seeing you again, both virtually and in person at programs this fall. Please join us for our next virtual program, Chicago Modernism and the Ludlow Typograph on Tuesday, September 14th at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. This event is produced by the Caxton Club of Chicago and features the Newberry's curator emeritus, Paul F. Gale. Or for an in-person event, grab a bike and join our community ride through the Pilsen and Humboldt Park neighborhoods to visit monuments, murals, and other works of public art that memorialize and interpret the revolutionary struggles of the Americas. The ride will take place on Saturday, September 18th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. You can register for these and other programs on our website, newberry.org. Thank you.